Hey there, Brittany from Equipping Godly Women here. And today I thought it would be fun if we did something a little bit different and did a sort of Q&A slash ask me anything. So last week, if you got my email, I emailed out asking you, what are your questions? What do you wanna ask me? What should we chat about? And several of you emailed me to let me know what is on your mind, what you'd like help with, and just some random questions about me. So today I wanted to take a little bit to answer these questions and hopefully help you out with some things that you might be dealing with or just kind of satisfy your curiosity for things you might have been wondering. So definitely stay tuned. We are gonna cover so many topics today and it's gonna be really good. All right, so let's dive right on in with question number one. Any advice for how to deal with worry, fear, or anxiety? This is a great question. Worry is definitely something that has run in my family, so I have dealt with it a lot over the years, and I know that it's something that a lot of you deal with as well. So let me start by saying I do have an article on Equipping Godly Women that lays out how to deal with worry, so I will link that below if you struggle with this and you want the whole like step-by-step, -step, here's everything. Um, but for now, I'm just going to give you a couple really quick tips and tricks to make it easier. So first of all, the first thing you want to do is figure figure out what it is that you worry about. Everybody who worries usually doesn't worry about everything, um, but has one or two things that really cause them to worry more than others. So what is it that you worry about? Do you worry about your kids? Do you worry about um, your job? Do you worry about your marriage? Do you worry about your health? Um, identify first right now in your head, you can probably just think of it. What is it that you worry about? And then the second thing that I want you to do is use those worries as a cue to prayer. So you don't have to remind yourself to worry. Like it just happens on its own. These thoughts pop up in your head. But a lot of times we need a reminder to pray about them. So use those worries as a reminder. So when those worries come into your brain and you start to think, oh my goodness, what if something happened? You know, what's going to happen? And all these worries come up, just take a second and say, okay, stop. We're not going to worry we're going to pray instead. And so you're still kind of at this point thinking of these thoughts, but you're totally reframing the way that you're thinking of them. And you're taking them to God and you're just getting honest with him and asking for his help. So you're saying, God, I'm really worried about my kids right now. Or God, I'm really worried about this right now. I don't want to be worried. I want to trust you. God, help me to trust you more. And just pray to him things like, God, I know you're under control or you have everything under control. God, I know that you love my family as much as I do. God, I know that you want what is best for me. God, please take care of the situation. God, please help everything to work out in the way that will bring glory and honor to your name. God, just be involved in the situation. Help us to feel your presence. Help us to feel your peace. And you can pray prayers like this and using those worries as a reminder is a great way to make sure that you are praying throughout the day. And as you are handing them over to God and trusting and making the decision to trust him, um, that makes it a lot easier as you go on and as you practice. It's not something that will happen right away. But as you go on, it makes it a lot easier to stop the worries as soon as they start to pop up and say, nope, I am going to trust God. I'm going to take it to him. And I know and I trust he can deal with this. He is big and he is able and he can do anything. He can absolutely take care of the situation in his way, in his time. And I'm going to give it to him knowing that he will take care of it. So that's the first thing I would do is to pray. Another thing that is really helpful is to meditate on scripture. And what I mean by this is just to go in the Bible and find a verse or two that is going to be really helpful for your exact situation. That when these worries pop up, that you can repeat these verses to yourself and kind of declare them out into the world that no, this is what I believe. So for example, a probably a couple of years yeah, it was several years ago now. My husband used to work out of town. And so I would have to go to bed by myself at night in this house all by myself in the dark. And I'm totally too old to be scared of the dark, but I don't like laying in this house by myself in the dark. And I would start to worry or fear or feel afraid. So I memorized a verse. Psalm 4, 8 says, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And when I memorized this verse, anytime that I was afraid or fearful as I went to go to sleep, I could just say this verse over and over and over to myself. So my thoughts weren't saying, you know, what could happen, what's going on, but it was saying, I will lie down, I will sleep in peace. God makes me dwell in safety. And just having that verse and being able to repeat it again and again 
was so helpful because then I was filling my mind with scripture and peace rather than just letting the fears run rampant. So it's not just trying to shut off the worries, but actually replacing them with good thoughts instead, with prayers to God, with scriptures that you can meditate on, um, and just confidence and faith and peace in God. So that's what I would recommend. And then for additional help, I have a lot more in the article. So go ahead. If you are struggling with this, go check that out as well, because that's going to have a lot more really good, solid advice for you in that as well. How do you find good friends? I have a few friends that I love deeply, but they are not good for me. I have struggled with finding healthy relationships my whole life. It feels as if I attract abusive, narcissistic, and dysfunctional people. All right, so there's kind of two things going on in this question, and I'm going to address both of them, but briefly. The first one is if you just need more friends in general. Again, I have a whole article about this that I will link in the description below so that if you are someone who needs more good godly friends in your life, absolutely go check that out, and it has a lot more information for you. But I'm going to touch on a few things very briefly right now. So the first one is if you are having trouble finding friends, I would absolutely go join things where other awesome Christian people are likely to be. The first place that comes to mind is obviously church. If you are not involved in a local church, go get involved in a local church because I mean, honestly, if you were looking for Christians, go to a place where Christians hang out and that is a really good place. Um, If you are in an area where there are multiple churches, you might have to try around if one of them just, you know, you can't find friends and it's not a good church. Some churches are better than others. You might have to try out out a couple different churches to find one that's a really good fit. But go to church and don't wait for people to come up and talk to you because chances are they're not going to do it. That's just human nature. People are busy and distracted and focused on other things. So if you want friends, you need to be the one who reaches out to other people. So the way that has been easiest for me to do this, um, I'm an introvert. I do not naturally go up and make friends with people. Um, But the way that's easiest for me to do this has always been to be Um, by getting involved in things like go volunteer to help out in the children's ministry or go volunteer to help out with the youth group or go volunteer to help out with, you know, whatever um, mission project they have going on. You know, maybe they're breaking someone's leaves or, you know, cleaning up the church or whatever. When you are going and getting involved, um, that's a good way to get to know people in a really, um, non-threatening way. So you don't have to just walk up to them and be like, hi, let's be best friends forever. Um, But you can spend time around them as you are um, working together on things and get to know people that way. Um, You can also join Bible study groups. You probably have one at your church. If not, you can ask around at your church um, or other churches in your area. It does not even have to be at your own church, but find a um, Bible study or find a volunteer opportunity. If you get on Google and you look, you know, volunteer opportunities in your city, there might be something that pops up that way. But then going back to the second part of the question where you mentioned that you typically find yourself um, drawing in people who are dysfunctional or narcissistic. Honestly, in order to combat that is probably going to require getting a little bit vulnerable and going to somebody whose advice and opinion you trust and kind of having them vet some of your friends for you. Um, And I know that is um, I don't even know what word, like super vulnerable to do to say, hey, I'm not good at picking good friends and like getting honest about that. But that can be so helpful because a lot of times if you are around people who are narcissistic and dysfunctional, that kind of becomes your normal. And it's going to take some time in order to kind of readjust what you consider to be normal. Um, So you might want to go to your pastor or a youth pastor or to a a like really godly woman in your church and say, hey, here's what's going on with me. I really want to have good friends. I really want to surround myself with good people, but I find that I have a really bad habit of picking the wrong people. Can you just offer me any kind of advice or insights on these people and if this would be a good match for me? And ideally, it would be awesome if you were asking them, you know, here are some people in the church, do you think that they would be a good fit of friendship for me? Or, hey, can you recommend anybody in the church who you know is a really good person who I could try to like go hang out with? Um, And maybe they would know of somebody or maybe that they would know you well enough to say, okay, here's what I see in you. And then they would be able to get honest and say, hey, you were looking for attention. Hey, you were looking for drama. And just being able to point out very specific what it is about these people that is attracting them to you you to them, um, then that can kind of help break some of that as you can realize why you're doing it. 
um, and realize what that leads to and you know what to look for. Um, but that again is something that somebody in real life is gonna have to kind of help you out and hold your hand in that process. Um, you can obviously also go to the Bible and say, you know, what are the qualities of a good Christian person and see how closely they line up to that. Um, but I just feel like if you are in a place where your sense of normal is off, um, it would be really helpful to get a secondary opinion from somebody that you know you could trust, like a pastor or a um, like woman in your church who's in a position of leadership. How can you bring others to Jesus when they don't believe in God? The number one reason I get is how a good and loving God can allow horrendous things to happen, especially to children who are molested. All right, so the first thing that I would say about this is First of all, to keep in mind that their salvation is ultimately not your responsibility or um, your duty. And what I mean by this is, yes, we absolutely should be witnessing to people. Yes, we absolutely should be sharing the love of God with them. But it is God who ultimately saves and who brings about that salvation. All that we are called to do is to plant the seed and to water that. So we can't convince or force or make anyone believe. And we don't even need to go as far as to kind of justify God or to give a defense for him um, because he's God and he doesn't need us defending him. Um, but what we can do is basically to kind of talk with people and talk through the issues, especially if it seems that they are open and they have questions. Um, and that's a really awesome place to have people in when they are interested and curious, but they have questions. So if they're super angry and they want nothing to do with God at all, I wouldn't go so far as to try to convince them or force them or say, hey, you have to believe and here's why. Um, but just to kind of keep that dialogue open um, and to provide a good example in your life of faith and to share when it's appropriate to do so. Okay, here's what I believe and why. So practically speaking, the way that I would do that basically is first of all, just to live your life out as a Christian and to be a Christian and to do the things that Christians do and don't apologize about it. You know, pray when it's necessary to pray or not necessary. It's almost necessary. Um, pray and read your Bible and go to church and you don't have to apologize for that. Believe what you believe. Um, and you can share about it in a friendly way and you can say, hey, this is what's going on with me and this is why I believe what I believe. Um, as far as how God can allow such terrible traumatic things to happen, I do have a couple articles on the site about that as well that I will link below. Um, um, but basically what I want to say in short is just the fact that yes, bad things happen, but that was never God's design or intention. He created this world that was perfect, that was a wonderful where everybody, you know, got along and loved each other and there was no sin in the world. And the issue was that he gave us free will. Now he could have made us mindless robots who had to do what he wanted, but in his love, he didn't make us mindless robots. He gave us a choice to behave or not behave, to obey or not to obey. And humans, as you know, chose to obey. And we still do this every single day. Every single one of us makes sinful choices and those choices have consequences on other people. And yes, God can prevent that. And I mean, we get mad at God so many times because we say, you know, why didn't you prevent this? Well, how many things has he prevented that we don't even know about? And he doesn't get credit for that. So it's kind of unfair. I wouldn't say this to the people who are struggling with this, but just to you, like he also has prevented so many things as well. And then for the things that do still um, happen, well, God has provided ways to prevent them that we as humans are not taking. You know, how, like people who are starving in Africa, well, how, you know, have you given money to that? Like you have the ability, he created a way for them to have help, he created you and are you doing it? Um, he created a way for the people who um, are struggling with all these things to have help, but we as Christians are dropping the ball. So that's not on God, that's on us because he did not do wrong to create us. He did not do wrong to give us free will. He gave us the ability to make good choices and we rejected him. And that's you know, the downfall of sinful nature. And he gave us the resources and ability to do something about it. And as Christians, we don't. So that's on us. And we should, as Christians, be mad at ourselves that we're not doing more. Um, obviously not to earn our salvation, but because there are hurting people out there, that's our responsibility to go do something about that. And we are not. So yeah, they should be mad and we should be mad. 
But we shouldn't be mad at God because that's not his fault. Yes, he could have prevented it. He could have taken away our free will, but we also could have prevented it um, by getting resources and love and help in place. So yeah, be mad, but then don't use that anger to push you away from God. Use it to spur you into action. What could you do to help this? Can you go and... You know, I don't know any statistics or demographics of who is most likely to engage in these kinds of behaviors, but can you go volunteer with someone like Big Brothers, Big Sisters, who is a mentor to younger people before they get into these situations? Can you donate to homeless shelters or to battered women's shelters or to all of these places so that people would have the resources that they need to go live their life without having to fall into these terrible situations that people fall into. Obviously, sometimes it's because of sin. And honestly, sometimes it's because people don't have the resources they need to make better choices. And we as Christians absolutely can and should be doing things about that on the preventative side of things. So um, for more of an argument of why God allows suffering, go check out the whole article. But there's just a few thoughts I wanted to share on that. You've probably shared this before, but I'm fairly new to your emails. Would you share your testimony with us? And also, you said you don't want to be Catholic. Have you now joined your husband in Catholic Church? Question mark, question mark. Any update? Okay, so that was two separate questions, but they go together, so I'm going to answer them together. Um, so a little bit about my testimony. I did grow up in church pretty much my entire life. Um, my grandfather was a preacher, and my mom was a pastor's daughter, and so I just kind of came by it naturally. My mom is an awesome Christian woman who totally walked out every day exactly what it means to be a true Christian, not just a Sunday Christian who goes on Sundays and then goes about the rest of the week. But I just saw her model every single day, like what it's like to just dive in as much as you could, you know, when times are easy and when times are tough, because every family has tough things, but still just watching her cling to the Lord through all of that um, provided such a good example for me. Then in high school, I kind of went through a rough time. I have shared a little bit about this on the website, but not a whole lot. Um, basically, I was depressed. I was anorexic. Um, just a lot of spiritual warfare kinds of things that I went through um, that were really rough on everybody at the time. Uh, there really wasn't anything wrong. It absolutely was just um, spiritual warfare, which I really need to get around to writing a post on that one of these days. Um, so just a lot of yuckiness that I was dealing with that left me feeling really far from God. Um, I still believed in him. I still went to church every Sunday, but it's just such a mess to constantly cry out to him and just something was off in my head. So I ended up going on to Christian college. Um, and that was probably the time of my life where I felt the farthest away from God. I still believed in him. I still went to church. I still was at Christian college reading my Bible. Um, but I just went to a Christian college that happened to feel a whole lot like a bubble. And that they had a really strong emphasis on missions. So I would go out into the inner city where this college was located, and I would try to help real people who had real problems who went to church on Sunday and were just honest about, hey, here's what I'm dealing with. And they would lay it all out there and they would come to meet Jesus. And then I would go back to college where everyone was like, we are perfect Christians and we have no problems ever. And we go to church because we're wonderful and our lives are, you know, greeting card perfect. Um, and it just felt so fake and terrible to me um, that I didn't really want anything to do with any of it. Um, and it just was not a fun time where I just really didn't feel close to God at all. I still believed in him, but I was like, you know, this is junk. I don't want, yeah, this is nonsense. I want to go out and feel things that are actually real and be a part of real life and not just in this little like fake bubble. Um, so that was not fun. But anyways, so then after that, basically what happened is I met my husband. We got pregnant and got married in that order. Um, and so that just kind of started a whole different time period in my life um, where everything was kind of taken away from me in a sense, um, which wasn't a bad thing because it was kind of a time of healing for me. Um, as I was taken out of that bubble and I was taken away from everybody, I lost pretty much all of my friends um, and my husband started going to work out of town, as I mentioned earlier. So he was gone, everybody was gone. Um, and even people who wanted to be there, I just shut everybody out and wanted nothing to do with anybody. And I just sat in our little apartment, just me and my little infant baby 
all week, every week, week after week. Um, and it was just a time where I had nothing and nobody, but not in a bad way, really, um, because God just came and met me in that season where he was like, you know what, I'm still here and we're going to deal with this stuff and we're going to work through all this junk from high school. We're going to work through it um, and all of these lies you've been holding on to and all of these issues and things, even growing up in a Christian home like Everybody has stuff they deal with, and God is like, you know what? We're going to deal with all this stuff. Um, and he used my husband totally as my husband is amazing, um, and God has just used him over the last several, several years to just kind of pick out and point out all of these things in my life um, and to get rid of them. Um, so at this point, I was just home, just me and a baby, um, and then another baby came along, and then I was like, you know, I'm home, I'm doing nothing, I have this college degree I'm not using, um, I have a lot of debt from having babies uh, because they're expensive and we didn't have good insurance. So I said, well, you know, I'm home, I might as well just start writing online articles because um, I had read that you could um, earn a living that way, or, you know, just a little bit of extra income writing online. So I was like, oh, I'll start that. So that's kind of how I got started with equipping godly women. Um, no plans or dreams or desires or anything. I was just like, I'm home, I'm bored. I have two babies. I have nothing to do. I'm going to start writing. Um, and that kind of blossomed into this, what we have today, which is awesome. And I love it. Um, and then in the meantime, another big thing that happened, going back to the question of, you said you don't want to be Catholic, but am I now Catholic? Um, there really isn't a lot of update on that. If you have read the update that I published like a year ago, it's been forever. But for those of you who are a little bit out of the loop, what happened is um, I grew up in a Christian home my entire life. I married my husband. Well, it turns out my husband is Catholic and a very committed Catholic. Um, and I, apparently some people grow up thinking you know, Catholics are horrible, evil people. I didn't grow up with much of an opinion either way. Um, so when we got married, I was like, cool, you're Christian, I'm Christian. We both love Jesus. Like, I didn't think anything of it. It wasn't really an issue for either of us. Um, and then his mom came to me and she was like, so tell me more about what you believe and why, because I know it's really different than what I believe. And I don't really know. Um, so I was like, sure, you know, we'll talk about it. I like to talk about faith stuff. Um, so we started talking and she gave me a book and she started asking me some really good questions. Um, and then as we're having babies and we have to make decisions about, do we baptize them? We know what church do we go to? And we have to make all these decisions. I was like, okay, well, I don't want to just say, we have to do it my way. I want to get in and see, you know, what does the Bible say? And that's always been my thing. So I started getting in the Bible and, okay, what does the Bible actually say about this? What does the Bible actually say about this? And as I started researching, I realized, oh my goodness, so much of what I had been taught growing up in the church that I had grown up in actually was not biblical at all. Um, and that was a very unsettling feeling because I had such a strong faith and then to realize, I actually got so much of it wrong. Just, you know, I was taught things that really were not biblical. Um, so that has kicked off probably the last decade or so of my life um, that I've gotten in and just really dug into, you know, what do Catholics believe? Um, at this point, I'm still, like I said, where I was about a year ago, where a lot of it makes a lot of sense to me. I am not fully convinced on all of it yet. And the biggest thing that's really holding me back at this point is that in order for me to convert and become Catholic, um, I have to go through a process where one of the steps is that I have to get up in front of the church and God and man and everyone and be able to recite words that basically say that I believe the Catholic Church is 100% right about everything they teach. Not everything that they do culturally, because all faith traditions have their own things they just kind of do because, um, but their official doctrine that 100% of it is correct. And um, so that was kind of the point of the process that I dropped out on. Um, I said, you have a lot of good things to say. A lot of it makes sense. But for me to say 100% is true, uh, I can't say that really about anything in my life. I'm just not that kind of person who like believes 100%. Um, I was like, you know, if 99%, you know, maybe we could talk, but 100%, like I can't give you that. Um, so I'm now still in the process of going through, I'm reading through the catechism to say, you know, what do they believe? And I'm trying to make a list in my brain of, okay, here are official Catholic beliefs and then taking them to the Bible. Okay, how does it line up? Um, I have a couple of priests that I call and I talk to and I say, okay, here's what this says in the cate catechist. How does it line up? Like, how do you reconcile? What does this mean? I want to make sure that I am understanding what you actually mean by it and not just, you know, what I think it means. 
Um, so it's a really long, in-depth, thorough process um, of me just taking everything Catholics believe, making sure that I know what Catholics believe and that I know accurately um, the official teaching and not just what Catholics think is Catholic teaching. Um, so taking all that, comparing it to scripture, I'm still at a point where I can't say 100%, um, but we do go to Catholic Mass every week. Um, our kids go to Catholic school and we... I mean, I don't write anything on the cath on the blog that is anti-Catholic or, you know, I don't, like if I switch to Catholicism, I don't really think it would honestly change much of anything for me. Um, but no, I have not converted. I am still doing a ton of research on that slowly, but surely. So that's where I am with that. I have no problem with it either way. I'm kind of in the middle. I'm kind of in the camp of I believe in the Bible and what the Bible says, that's what we're going to go with. Uh, but the Bible is a big book and the catechism is a big book. So just, you know, sorting through all the granular small details. Um, that's where I'm at right now. What is your take on LGBTQ issues? Am I to love them, but hate what they are? I don't know how it's possible to do both. Fear of man isn't my issue. I just don't see how alienating them is helping to win hearts. Okay, so this is one issue I actually don't have any articles about because I kind of shied away from writing it. Not because I don't have beliefs, but I'm in the same camp as you of, yes, we do absolutely want to proclaim the gospel and there is scriptural truth, but we don't want to alienate people in the process. So I want to start by making a distinction. First of all, you have to realize there are people who are, obviously, people who are Christian and people who are not Christian. So for people who are Christian, we absolutely hold them to Christian standards because they have chosen, they want the Holy Spirit inside of them, they should behave accordingly. Now, for people who are not Christians, it is unfair to expect people who are not Christians to behave like Christians. Not that the same laws and God's rules and everything still aren't good and valid. However, as Christians, we have the help and the conviction of the Holy Spirit that helps us to live in a way that is holy. For people who do not have the Holy Spirit, it is unfair to them to expect them to behave that way. So, there's a couple points I want to make about this. Um, first of all, the biggest issue really isn't the lifestyle choice that they make, but the fact of them knowing Jesus. If they are not Christian, I honestly would not even concern myself about it at this point, just because that's not the biggest issue. I do believe that the Bible is clear that this is not God's best for us and that it is sin. However, there are also a whole Bible full of other things that are sins that every single one of us also deals with. So if you want to go and get angry at people because they are living this way, then you also have to go and turn around and get angry at every single Christian who should be held to a higher standard, who is still living with worry and fear and anxiety and anger and all of these other things. Every Christian in the entire world is dealing with idolatry for one, like it doesn't get more serious than that. So it would be very unfair to pick on non-Christians who are dealing with this lifestyle while simultaneously being a Christian who is dealing with idolatry. And by idolatry, obviously I don't mean bowing down to idols, but putting anything ahead of God in your life. So my stance is yes, it is wrong. However, I am not going to pick on non-Christians in this lifestyle because the reason that I believe that it is wrong is because God says it's wrong and if they don't believe in God then why would they believe it's wrong that doesn't even logically make sense so my thing for one is not to pick on people but to love them when Jesus came and walked the earth and the Pharisees said you know what are the greatest commandments um, yeah, there are commandments about you shouldn't do all of these things, but God said the greatest commandment is to love God and love others. So my stance is that I would absolutely do my best to love people to Jesus. And once they are Christian, then let God work on them because the gospel, um, it says in the Bible, the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. If they are not Christian, it does not make sense to them. We can't expect it to make sense to them. It's not supposed to. Um, but and you're not going to win anybody by being like, you are a terrible, horrible sinner and blah, blah, blah. Um, but if you can just show people the truth of the gospel and say, you know what? There is a God 
and God does hold us to a standard. And you can say this so politely, even if you were talking to somebody in this lifestyle who's not a Christian, this is exactly what I would say. So you know what? I believe in God. I do believe he exists and I believe that he loves every single one of us so, so, so much, so much that he even sent his son to die for us. Um, but the thing is, there's something that is hurting our relationship with him. And that thing is that he has a standard that he wants us to live up to. And when we are not living up to his standard, that's called sin and it breaks our relationship with him. And there are tons of sins and we all deal with sin um, and something we all struggle with every day. Um, and just kind of share the gospel in that way. You know, God calls us to the standard and there's sin. Um, and so God asks us because he loves us to give up anything that would stand in between us. And you don't even have to pick on them, especially if they're not a Christian. Um, but just to share the gospel and God's love with them. And then once they are Christian, we can sort all the details out down the road because honestly, your entire life, even once you are a Christian, is sorting out all the details. We are all still dealing with anger. We're all still dealing with fear and all of these other things. None of us has it all figured out. So don't pick on people because of the sin. And it's not fair at all to expect them to live like a Christian if they're not. Um, and by that, I also mean people who think they're Christian who aren't actually Christian because that's totally an option as well. If they're not actually a Christian who is genuinely dedicated to walking towards God in truth and following the Bible no matter what, then they're not actually a Christian. Um, so it's not fair to act like they are. Um, if there's somebody who is radically like opposed, like, hey God, I want nothing to do with that, um, let them be. They have free will, that's their choice. Uh, if they are curious about God and want to learn more, then I honestly would not even worry about that just yet. Um, just be a loving example of God. God calls us to love people. Um, we all sin. We all make mistakes. But that doesn't mean that we can't love them. I mean, the Bible tells us when we were sinners, God loved us. And that's what we should do to others. Love them for who they are, um, who God made them to be. Love the person. Um, and you can do that without accepting every part of their lifestyle, just like you would do if you had a friend who was really awesome, but drank a little too much on the weekends, or if you had a friend who was really awesome, but they were divorced. It's pretty much the same thing. And I might get flack for that, but the truth is we all have sins that we're dealing with. Um, so that's kind of how I would respond to that. I can't stand watching or listening to anything with foul language or offensive, vulgar content. So I often leave the room or put in earbuds and listen to something else. But even my believing family members slash relatives frequently laugh about it or get irritated and tell me not to be so sensitive. Am I misinterpreting his word and really just being too sensitive? Okay, so in some cases, this kind of falls into a gray area. And in the Bible, it does tell us, um, Paul writes about that there are gray areas. There are things that some believers feel really strongly convicted upon and things that other Christians don't feel strongly convicted upon. So God does have a standard where he expects us to be at. And his standard is perfection, like literally not a single sin ever like perfection. Um, but we are all on a journey to get there and we are on different places of that journey. So our responsibility as Christians is to, for one, for ourselves to get as close to the standard of perfection as possible with God's help um, to, and to do everything we can to get there, but also not to um, pick on people who may not be as close as we are. So there are things like this in my own life. For example, um, just a random, very good example in my life. My husband has no problem watching Harry Potter. I, for my own self, I'm not saying for everybody, I myself will not watch Harry Potter. So he knows this. Thankfully, he's respectful enough. Um, but when he puts it on, sometimes he forgets and he'll put it on. I will just leave the room or go do whatever. Um, I don't make a big deal out of it. His salvation is not my concern. It's not my job to convict him. That's the Holy Spirit's job. So I just kind of do what's right for me. Um, and I'm not saying that there's multiple standards, but I'm, you know, for me, I am responsible for me. So I will leave and I don't make a big deal out of it. Um, and I just let him do his own thing. Um, so that's how I handle it. Thankfully, he doesn't bother me about it. Um, if your family is bothering you about it, honestly, I would keep doing what you're doing if it bothers you. That's awesome. That means your spiritual radar is a little more in tune. Perfect. Um, 
just set an example. And if they are bothering you, just ignore them because honestly, God's approval is way more important than their approval. Um, you can tell them very politely, you know what? I really am committed to being a really awesome Christian. And the Bible tells us that we should think about things that are pure and lovely. And I am, I'm not going to get it right. I know I'm going to mess up a lot of times. Um, but I am going to do my best. And this is just one thing that I can do to kind of be, um, as I don't know how to say that in a way, I, you know, nothing that's offensive to them, but, you know, say, I really want to follow God as much as I can. And this is just one little thing that I can do. Um, if you want to watch it, you can do what you want. You are responsible for you, but I would ask that you would please be respectful of me as I am trying to do my best here. And if you're not making it difficult for them and you're not like telling them you're horrible people, how could you put this on? Um, let them be and you go do your own thing. And that's honestly how I would deal with it. All right, last question. Do you pray together with your husband regularly? I am terrified to do this, but would love to get over myself and start praying with my husband. I pray with my kids regularly, but when it comes to praying with my husband, I freeze. Do you have any advice? So honestly, my husband and I do not have any kind of regular routine where we regularly sit down to pray together or read the Bible together. Um, we do both pray. We do both read our Bibles. It's just not part of our habits right now um, where we sit down and do these things together. But my advice for you, if this is something that you really want to get started, I think that is awesome. Um, probably the easiest way if you are already praying with your kids is just to invite him to join you. Or if you're feeling really nervous, have the kids go invite him to join you. That's something I actually do a lot. Um, I do. It's bad. But anyways, um, you can say, hey, we're going to pray, kids. Do you think daddy would like to join us? Do you guys want to go ask him? Um, and you can send your kids if you're feeling nervous, you know, send them and they'll be like, dad, come for, you know, and who can say no to their kids? And if they do, you know, your kids won't be crushed. Like parents say no to kids all the time. Um, so you can have your kids say, Hey, come pray. Or you could go out to him and say, Hey, you know, I pray with the kids and would you like to join us and make it a whole family thing? Um, and if he says no, then that's fine. And if he wants to join you, that's awesome. Um, if you would rather have a time just with him, um, where it's not with your kids, then I think the first thing to do would be to find a really good time where you think um, would be a good time to do that. You don't want to interrupt him when he's in the middle of doing things. Not that you couldn't, it just would be more difficult. Um, so if there's a time of day where you generally see that he's not doing a whole lot or you have a little bit of extra time, um, just to sit down with him and say, hey, um, so I'm trying to make prayer more of a priority in my life and I would like to pray more. I was wondering if you might like to pray with me or you could say something like, hey, I want to pray more, um, but I'm having trouble remembering, you know, do you want to um, kind of pray with me to kind of help me remember and make it a routine or whatever you want to say, however you want to phrase it or say, hey, you know, I, my faith is so important to me and I want to pray a lot, but um, I really wish that this was something that we could share together. I would love to be closer to you in this way. Um, figure out what you're going to say first and then just go to him at a time where he seems calm and relaxed and doesn't have a lot going on. Obviously not when he's busy or stressed out about other things. And yes, um, I know it is totally terrifying sometimes just to like get up the courage to ask these things. Um, but you have to remember your husband loves you. And if your husband loves the Lord, um, he's not going to be mad at you or like throw things at you. Like what's the worst that can happen? He might say no, in which case you're at the same exact position that you're in right now. Um, so you haven't lost anything. Um, but it's just sometimes you just have to take a deep breath, count down from five and just do it. Um, and the longer that you wait, the more you procrastinate, the harder it's going to be. Um, if you have to set a time and you're gonna to say, tonight, I am going to talk to him. Or even tell somebody who is easier to talk to, like tell a girlfriend, like, hey, I really want to do this. Tonight, I am going to talk to him. Ask me tomorrow and make sure I do it. And if you have that like extra person who you know is gonna follow up with you, it might be easier um, to force yourself to ask hard questions when you know you're going to have accountability tomorrow. Um, so a lot of times I think it's just taking a deep breath, finding a good time and just doing it because what's the worst that could happen? Not a whole lot. And what's the best that could happen? You guys could start a prayer time together. That would be so encouraging um, and strengthening for your marriage and your faith. And that would be awesome. 
All right, so that is all of the questions that I had for today. Hopefully you found these interesting and helpful. Um, maybe we will do something like this again in the future. If you love this video, definitely leave me a comment down below um, and let me know. Maybe we'll do one again. Otherwise, I will be back with more videos and interviews and all kinds of encouragement for you here soon. Bye.